Father Ted, uh, before the break, I raised the question of um, does by the end justify the means? Um, that's a classic theological um, statement that we have to address, and people address in every generation. It, well, I mean, ends justifying means, there's always been a very strong tradition that you can't, if you just identify good ends, though that cannot provide the total rationale for the utilization of any means to get to those good ends. And unfortunately, in the biotechnologies today, uh, the development of the biotechnologies, we see a lot of argumentation in that direction. There's a certain amount of that argumentation, you know, that we just looked at with respect to in vitro, that the end is good, the baby is a desired end. Uh, but of course, part of the problem there as well is that one is turning the child into an object, uh, an object that gratifies my own desire, rather than as a subject who is willed into being by acts of, of self-giving uh, and love between husband and wife. So the problem of means and ends uh, raises its head repetitively. I mean, even arguments about the utilization of stem cells uh, are commonly couched in that kind of language because what is presented usually is, is a very real good, the curing of maladies and diseases, of you know, sometimes very awful diseases. And people say, doesn't that justify the use of virtually any means that we you know, as intelligent people who have developed scientific means should be able to use. Uh, and I think clearly there are, there have to be limits uh, on the way that science is carried out. And we see that in other areas. I mean, for example, studies on uh, biological weapons. You don't allow just anybody to work with biological weapons. You insist that it be a highly regulated sort of an endeavor if it's allowed to be done at all. Uh, and so biotechnologies are something very similar to this, that there are real threats to human dignity that come in and uh, we can't just simply allow it to be a completely uh, open free-for-all among the scientists who, who do this type of work. Father, um, let's talk a little bit about cloning, because I know there's two aspects of it. One, of course, is uh, a harvesting aspect and one, of course, is the birth aspect, which kind of goes along with in vitro, in vitro fertilization. Yes. Um, Some people see the uh, birth aspect as just a logical extension of in vitro. In other words, that if you have the, the mindset that you have a right to a child, then cloning would just represent, you know, another avenue for you to obtain the desired child. Uh, and so I think we need to be very clear about that, that we don't want to be treating a child as an object, as something that I have a right to. But what is it that a couple really has the right to when they get married? It's they have the right to those acts that are ordered and disposed in and of themselves to the procreation of new life. But that life may or may not come. Uh, but they never have the right to the baby itself. Uh, so in terms of cloning, then, the reproductive cloning is this attempt to make basically an identical twin of somebody. What it is is a type of very radical genetic engineering. In genetic engineering, as you know, you choose one desired feature. So if you have a, uh, a son and you would like that son to be a good basketball player, you might attempt to genetically engineer him to grow taller. Uh, and cloning represents the choice to choose all the characteristics of your child, basically saying that I would like my child to be a replica of somebody else with all those features. So it represents a type of, of very serious domination by the parents over their own children, over their own progeny, uh, in a way that is unjust. So that's, that is the, the reproductive dimension of it. Meanwhile, for the other type of cloning, therapeutic cloning, what is it that you're actually doing? Well, you're doing the same series of steps that you did before to make the baby, only you never place the developing embryo into a womb, into a uterus. So the net effect is you allow it to grow to a certain stage where it's ready to harvest, and then you harvest its stem cells. And the reason you do that is because you can then use those stem cells. If I made a clone of myself, I can use those stem cells, transplant them into me, and my body will not reject them. 
Meanwhile, if I were to take a random embryo that's out there in the deep freeze, uh, my body would reject any stem cells that we pulled out of that random embryo. So this idea of therapeutic cloning is a, it's sort of a clever scientific approach to get around the problem of immune rejection. Uh, but I think you can see what the moral concern here is. It's really a very serious one that we are generating new human life for the explicit and premeditated purpose of destroying it. In order to harvest its stem cells. Exactly. In order for to our harvest own better its, help. That's right. So it's really an instrumentalization of another human being in, in the most explicit uh, and unpleasant way. Kind of like the lab's equivalent of the death camps. It really is. And you know, at the end of the last World War, in, we learned some bitter lessons. And I mean, the Nuremberg Code was written to specifically codify and explain the circumstances under which you could do human experimentation. And really, it was, you know, there were many errors that were made, and they codified and said, you know, you can never do an intervention that you know beforehand is going to either disable, injure, or destroy another human being. So we're, we're you know, at a very dangerous point in a certain sense as a Western civilization. We are uh, faced with this challenge of whether we're going to walk back down that very dark and ominous alley that we emerged from at the end of the last World War. And I hope that we don't.